Way back in 1999, New Zealand began talks with Chile and Singapore about forming a trilateral trade bloc. That initiative has since expanded into what is known as the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Today, 11 countries are negotiating their way through this expansive free trade agreement. Significant among those countries are the United States, Australia and most recently, Canada. The Prime Minister John Key said the TPP is a conduit within which New Zealand can establish a free trade agreement with the United States. The government believes the TPP will create wealth for New Zealand companies, its businesses and the country as a whole. But the University of Auckland's Professor Jane Kelsey sees it differently. And we talk to Professor Kelsey now about her concerns. Uh, Professor Jane Kelsey, welcome to the programme. Lovely to be here. Uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement is currently under negotiation. It's coming to Auckland soon. Um, what, what's the current state of the negotiations at this time? Well, the 11 countries were hoping that they would have tied up a deal by the end of this year. Mm. The reality is that this negotiation is now very complicated. There are 29 working parties who are trying to stitch up rules for the future that will govern everything from ordinary kind of exports to investment to how we make our domestic policies to how we uh, buy and sell and regulate our medicines. Even to cultural things, and the, music. The whole of the digital domain. Yeah. And in a sense, there is such overreach, not only with the number of areas, but in particular with the aggressive demands mm. that the US, which is the main player amongst these 11 countries, is putting on the table, that it's pretty bogged down. And indeed, there are some who are wondering whether it's bitten off more than it can chew. Uh, and in fact, it will go on into an interminable future until someone pulls the plug. If there are so many sticking points, why are so many governments, so many countries willing to get around that negotiating table and basically to position themselves to have a slice of this action? Well, there's a whole layer of, of reasons here. Um, part of it is that the free trade and investment train of the last 30 years has been slowing, whether it's in the World Trade Organization or a variety mm. of other places. And they're putting a lot of eggs in this basket to try to make it the one that they can pull off. Mm. Uh, and that's actually part of their problem. There's other countries that have individual objectives. Um, New Zealand thinks it wants to sell more dairy products into the US. This is all the self-interest um, that comes. It's all, all the commercial interests. Mm. And of course, the US has more commercial interests than anybody, whether it's the pharmaceutical companies, the mining companies, the banks, the Hollywood industries, mm. and so on. So there are those elements that they're pushing. But there's also, uh, from the US end, a really big geopolitical dynamic here. So you're talking about this thing between the United States and China yeah. and how it hits here in the Pacific region. Yeah, yeah because the US has been losing leverage and, and it's aware that China's ascendancy is growing in the region. And indeed, half of these countries involved in this negotiation are countries within Asia, from Vietnam and Malaysia and Singapore to Brunei, New Zealand and Australia. And the US wants to lock us into their world, uh, not in a complement mm. to China, but in a competition. So many of the viewers would be well aware that the United States and China have kind of been positioning in a, in almost in an aggressive, particularly from the United States side, an aggressive thing militarily and security wise. So you're saying that you're seeing evidence coming through from even in trade negotiations that there is this kind of standoff between the two. Is China responding in a similar manner? Well, there's a very fascinating and I think quite scary dynamic happening. We had Hillary Clinton last year saying this is going to be America's Pacific century mm. and it's going to have the military limb where they will move their troops from Iran and uh, Iraq and Afghanistan towards um, Australia, Singapore, yes. Korea, etc. And the economic limb will be the Trans-Pacific Partnership. At the same time, China is just part of a new negotiation they say is going to be the biggest ever mm. agreement, which is all the ASEAN countries mm. plus six, which includes Japan, Korea, China, 
Australia, New Zealand and India. So does that make it hard for those ASEAN countries like New Zealand as a part of that, um, but particularly the Southeast Asia um, blocs, to actually embark on this TPP with the United States, obviously the lead nation in this whole negotiation? Is it difficult for them? I considering think at China's present view? people have been taking a quite short-term pragmatic approach but as we're seeing the US agenda unfolding, there's increasing nervousness. And in fact, Trade Minister Gross has said, if the Trans-Pacific Partnership became a China bashing exercise, New Zealand will walk away mm. from the table. Recent statements from um, both of the US presidential candidates has made it clear that they see the Trans-Pacific Partnership as a bulwark against China. And we are going to be pincered in the middle there. The and we should the walk away from it like. because uh, locking ourselves into either of those dynamics is, is not going to be good for our independent future. Well, let's look later on in the program about the possibilities of walking out on a deal like this and whether or not it's a reality, a, po a possible reality. But in the first instance, if you were in the mindset of the New Zealand government, what specific benefits would you think that they believe that they can acquire from signing up to such an agreement at this stage in the negotiations? They will point to two benefits. One is Fonterra equals New Zealand's national interest. We need to be able to send, sell more dairy products into the US. Um, that's a fallacy for several reasons. One, we actually don't need more markets to sell our dairy products. Uh, we need better value dairy products. Uh, but beyond that, we know that any agreement is going to have to pass the US Congress. Mm. They have an effective veto on this. Mm. The agricultural lobby is extremely powerful in the US, and it's very clear that there are not going to be concessions of any significance on dairy. P particularly from the Wyoming states, etc., where the big agricultural commodity Absolutely. exporters themselves. Absolutely. The second uh, rationale that you hear in particular from Tim Grosser is that this will provide a 21st century gold standard template that other countries of real significance to New Zealand will join, such as Japan and Korea, uh, and countries that we may find it difficult to negotiate a bilateral agreement yeah, a with. one-on-one -on -one free trade agreement. Uh, and, but again, the prospect that those countries are going to sign up to some kind of American-led template that they had no role in negotiating is fantasy land. Like, for example, you see news reports, particularly in the mainstream media, that are highlighting a possibility that South Korea may be wanting to position to have a go at this um, Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Um, do you see that as a likelihood, considering that, once again, South Korea has the same kind of agricultural kind of protectionisms, that it's long gutted for many years, um, uh, you know, that it has at risk on such a thing? Uh, I think. Korea is very remote in, in this game plan at present. What's the most uh, prominent uh, then? Japan is the most likely, and I, I've been up there uh, a number of times in mm. the last couple of years uh, talking to members of the Diet or the Parliament who are adamantly opposed to this. Um, their concern is that this is being used as a means to force domestic restructuring within Japan. And they're already dealing with the major fallout from Fukushima mm. Uh, and the issues around reopening of the power plants, nuclear mm -hmm. power plants. They're dealing with a massive rise in their GST. Uh, there is huge political instability there. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, if Japan were to join, and it's still possible they might, the negotiations are even less likely to reach a conclusion than they are now. Okay, if we take it back to New Zealand. If New Zealand is signing up on the current kind of negotiations where you're seeing it tr um, uh, treading, uh, trending, what do Kiwi workers, Kiwi families, Kiwis themselves um, have at risk here? What, what kind of impact, negative impact, would they experience, say, in the first 12 months, two years? There are a whole lot of consequences in different parts of people's daily lives. Uh, one of the most prominent has been around medicines. You know, we have a system called Pharmac that makes the state's investment mm. in medicines go much further because of the way that Pharmac operates. Big pharmaceutical companies don't want to dismantle Pharmac altogether, they want a seat at table to be able to influence the decisions to maximise the returns to them. Mm. And so that will mean that medicines will become less affordable and it will mean that people who can afford health insurance that can get it topped up from there may be able to do okay, poor people will suffer. Hmm. If we look in other areas that are very poorly regulated, uh, such as in the mining 
sector. We see already the government is out um, looking at a whole lot of new exploration licenses. We know that the mining companies are opposing um, those uh, forms of re-regulation. There will be rules in there that if the government re-regulates in ways that seriously impact on the profitability of the investments of those companies, they can sue us in offshore tribunals to get returns, um, to, to get compensation uh, for um, the loss to their profits. Mm. The tobacco companies are another example. The so issues you've, you've around foreign investment of, in, in farms or mm. public-private partnership so these are contracts big issues to that run have been the, around. the hospitals or the water systems. Yeah. Um, yeah, a whole range of areas of our daily lives would be subject to these secretly negotiated and mm. externally enforceable so that's rules. So that's a big point. You can't see inside as such. You see perhaps what is coming out of, the, the information is coming out of those negotiations, which is obviously going through a control filter, if you like. Um, with, with these negotiations that are going to be taking place in Auckland um, between the 3rd and the 12th of December, so it's not far along, what are the main sticking points that you, know, you, you addressed at the beginning that was holding up their progress to finding an agreement themselves? What, what are those main sticking points between the nations around this table? The main sticking points are the US demands. They're so aggressive that many countries are now saying no. And they range across different areas. The pharmaceuticals that I mentioned is one. The aggressive demands in relation to the digital domain and controls over copyright and controls over the internet, including criminalization, uh, is another. A further area is the right of the foreign investors to sue, in the example I gave of the, of the mining yeah. companies, or we're seeing with the tobacco companies now in Australia about the plain packaging so laws. So outside interests controlling what you do in your own country. How, how different is this from um, previous free trade agreements, like the one that we've had with China for a few years now? Uh, there are elements of the bad parts of these agreements in our existing ones. The differences here are, one, this is the US. The US is not only mega player, but it's extremely aggressive and its corporations are very litigious. The second is that it combines with even further what they call behind the border disciplines on how governments can make their regulations and what those regulations can be. So it's intrusion on our domestic sovereignty and our domestic policy independence mm. is far, far greater than mm. any of the others we've had to date. Okay, if people and viewers here, if they're wanting to uh, follow this type of issue, um, they're wanting to get engaged, how do they do, how do, they do so? Well, there's going to be a lot of activities in different parts of the country, culminating in a National Day of Action on Saturday the 8th of December. Uh, there is a website, www.itsourfuture.org.nz, that has not only uh, the events that are happening, but a lot of resources to help people understand a bit more about these negotiations. And people need to not get frightened by the idea that this is some big complex trade agreement. It's actually very simple. We say TPPA stands for taking people's power away. Is it a done deal that no one can stop? No, but it can be rolled over very quickly if the politicians in the back rooms get together and do a bit of trading off. And we know our Prime Minister is very keen on doing backroom trading off. Uh, what we do need to do is to make it clear in our, our national domain that this is not a saleable deal to the people of New Zealand. And that in this country and in the other countries involved is will, what will stop this being concluded. Professor Jane Kelsey, thank you very much. That was Professor Jane Kelsey, and that's all from us this week. We will be back next week with more big issues and newsmakers. Until then, thanks for your company and take care. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.